Welcome to a very special place. The Isle of Man may be a small and rather wet and windy island stuck in the middle of the Irish Sea, but it's crammed full of influences from British, Irish, even Viking incomers. In fact, it's been a cultural crossroads for thousands of years, including a time when Celtic Christianity vied with Norse paganism to become the island's religion. The legacy of this battle for dominance were the keels, small, simple chapels that once covered the landscape. But today, every single one of these keels has either been destroyed by agriculture or dug, often badly, by antiquarians. Apart from one, which we hope will be nestling somewhere under the seventh fairway of the Mount Murray golf course. Time Team have been offered the unique opportunity of excavating the last remaining untouched keel on the island. We'll bring all our modern archaeological techniques and Phil Harding to bear on an investigation into the spiritual heart of the Isle of Man. And we've got just three days to do it. A thousand years ago, there were keels everywhere on the Isle of Man. Up to 200 on this one small island. Now, hardly any remain, and those that do are just hollowed out testaments to Victorian and Edwardian amateur archaeologists. But the one at Mount Murray is different. Miraculously, it avoided the fate of the other chapels, and after centuries of standing in an agricultural landscape, it now takes pride of place on a golf course that was redesigned to protect its remains. But before we get to grips with it, We've got to adapt to an island ravaged by the tail end of a hurricane coming in from the Atlantic. <laughs> Mick, over the years, we must have had at least 100 conversations yeah. around this 4x4. Yeah. I think this is the first one where you've actually been surreptitiously clutching the wheel arch yeah. so you don't blow away. I'm frightened of being blown into the hedge. <laughs> <laughs> Andy, you're the local archaeologist. Come in here a minute. Is that actually part of the keel? No, it's not. It seems to be a marker that's put up to ensure that ploughmen in the past haven't actually clipped the site itself. What period did they come from? Uh, we think that the sites have been in use from perhaps the 8th century, going out of use perhaps by the 12th century. But I think that, uh, that the sites have been occupied going back much earlier than that. Sometimes the burial grounds, we think, predate the chapels. So there's a lot of things there up for grabs to try and the, understand. The answer to your question is that most of them were dug by antiquarians in the early 20th century and they, they didn't really dig them in the right way and they didn't find out the sort of information we want to know today. In most cases they dug down into the middle, they didn't actually look at the outside, they didn't relate them to any burial grounds that are with them. Uh, and, and you know the whole context of them, we, we, we don't know anything about really. I mean, that, that would be a real first if we could actually date the structure in relation to burials and the site it's on. This is the last chance anyone will have to dig a keel. But we won't just investigate the chapel. We also want to understand the archaeology surrounding it. Do you think this is in situ, then, this stone here? Well, Andy? my initial view would be that it's perhaps been just lodged here for safekeeping. You know, right. It's by the, by the pillar that's uh, to put there to keep the ploughman off. But if it is in situ, um, then that's quite a rare, in fact, it's a real rarity. We've got uh, definitely one stone, and perhaps, perhaps one or two others, that are still in the positions that they were placed in medieval times. Right. But considering we've got 200 of these stone crosses from the whole of the island, so many of them now are just not where they were found. Phil, what on earth are you doing, mate? What do you mean, what am I doing? I'd have thought after 14 years it was blatantly obvious I'm opening up a trench and I'm digging it. But Mick! We don't usually simply put a trench in because we've got a marker stone. No, no, but we've got some geophysics from 14 years ago that show quite clearly, or appear to show, the site of the keel. There, look. Well, that's pretty crude, unsophisticated stuff, isn't it, John? You don't trust that? I think it's pretty good myself. W was it done by amateurs? No, it was done by us. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> <laughs> but presumably you could do better than that now. Well. Have a look at what we've re-surveyed. Oh, wow, look at that. That just shows the difference, doesn't it? Look I mean, at that. it really has sharpened things up with the new instrument. Yeah. What's exciting is we're digging here now where we think the keel is, and there appears to be an enclosure around it. Yeah. 
you know, there's so much more information in the latest results. So where else do you want to dig? Well, I think we've got to look at these ditches out here. Well, I've already marked a line out over What's there. What's a downslope on that side? Taking in the two and internal. Yeah. There have been burials discovered here before, so we could have an early Christian cemetery surrounded by an enclosure ditch. That could explain the presence of one of these ditches on the geophys, but two concentric ditches are much more of a puzzle. Hopefully, Matt's new trench will help resolve that particular archaeological mystery. But we're also interested in the graves John's identified in this trench, because carbon dating burials will help us build a timeline, and that's vital if we're to tell the story of the keel and its surroundings. The weather may be doing its best to dampen our spirits, but give Mick a medieval chapel and he wouldn't care if we were in the middle of a blizzard. What does a keel look like? Originally, when they were built, probably timber. Uh, later on, they seem to have been rebuilt in stone. Victor's done a drawing here look of a a sort of timber building. It probably was a bit more sophisticated than that, but not much. The irony is, you to me are like the archetypal agnostic bordering on an atheist. Yes. And yet you're passionate Absolutely. about early Christian life. Absolutely fascinated by it. I don't know what it is. I mean, I, I go around looking at churches. I've got friends who are monks in monasteries. I really don't understand it. There's something about the, the amount of, of energy and activity that goes into this. And I am. I'm absolutely gripped and fascinated by it. So basically, you've spent your whole life dedicated to something you don't understand? Yes. Yeah, a lot of us are like that, aren't we? <laughs> In spite of Mick's enthusiasm, our initial finds don't seem that auspicious. Andy! Look at these voids here. Look, this is absolutely diddle with them. And yet somehow, in among the golfing bits and bobs, Phil believes he may just have uncovered the first elements of the chapel, just a metre away from the carved stone cross. It's really hollow. Well, could be you've got a grave. I mean, we thought maybe this stone was a grave marker. This, these might be the slabs overlying that grave. Surely one of the crucial questions we wanted to answer was whether or not the graves were earlier or later than the stone-built chapel. Now, if this is a grave, we should be able to establish then what its relationship is to this row of stones. Now, to me, a row of stones is a wall. Do you think this is a wall? The way it's put together is not unlike walls that I've seen on, on these sites. Uh, could be, could be. We've got a lot of very white, water-worn pebbles coming up now. Yeah, the quartz, aren't they? Can you see that? Look. Oh, that's a big one. That really is. This there's a real variety of sizes of these. I've been looking at some in, in the incident room. Mm. There seems to be spreads of them around keels, and particularly around the eastern end of keels. So maybe they're being used to decorate altars or something like that as well. It looks like we may have the eastern end of the keel. Now all we have to do is find the rest of it. The weather, though, has improved from torrential rain to mere strong winds and persistent drizzle. And that seems to me the perfect time to retire to the warmth and dryness of the country club's foyer to find out more about Christianity's impact on the island. From the 5th century, we know that all of England, pretty much, with its Brythonic population, has probably been, been Christianised. They're starting to be traffic across the Irish Sea into Ireland, which are missionaries. The Isle of Man itself probably becomes thoroughly Christianised, and then we have another phase of development much later on when the Vikings start to move in across the North Sea. They occupy Orkney, they set up settlements in the Hebrides, they move into Ireland, particularly Dublin, and then probably the Isle of Man becomes part of the Viking kingdoms. It's at the crossroads of all of these things happening and that's why it becomes so interesting. Lots of cultural change. So why might digging this keel be so significant? Well, our keel could answer some of the really important questions that we've got, which are to do with this whole crossroads thing, as to at what point does the Isle of Man become thoroughly Christianised? And then later on, when we have the arrival of the Vikings, probably as a pagan people, at what point do they become Christianised? And this gives us the chance, perhaps, to answer those questions. 
you've got the, the pelvis there, but the, 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 the bone's actually right up against the stone. There's one yeah. of the stones of the grave going off to this way. Yeah. Back out in the rain, Matt's just uncovered our first bona fide burial. It's a kist, a stone-lined grave, containing a skeleton in remarkably good condition. And that's great news, as it's the first thing we may be able to carbon date. Matt, where's this burial on John's Geophys? Well, we've started on this blue line here. We've got over the first ditch, yeah. which is that circle there. Now, I think it's the first grey blob you come to there. So it's in between these two ditches here. What do we know about what's in there so far? Well, you're actually stood directly above the kiss, because it's one of these kiss greys, so it's got stone lining, one stone going off that way. And this individual that's in there, they're bums basically right up against that stone and their legs are going off in that direction and the body seems to be going that way. But for some people, a chapel and a stone-lined burial just aren't enough. And our shop in this, John, we had also these circles that look as if they might be, well, possibly prehistoric buildings or something like that. <laughs> I get the feeling if the archaeologists had it all their own way, we'd be digging up the whole golf course. That's the one I really want to go for, though. Yeah, that looks very interesting, doesn't it? Yeah. The problem is it's right in the middle of the fairway, the really short grass. So we can dig where the grass is a bit longer, but not that really short stuff. Yeah. So everything over there is gone, in yeah. fact. We've got to look... Well, what about <laughs> something like that one? You've already put the bloody trench in again, haven't you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, then the reason is this will take in four different elements. This inner ditch... Right. This curving ditch here, yeah. the ring there, and then this rather enigmatic curving oh, response wow. well, here. Oh, wow, that's good, isn't it? Three, four things in one trench. That's bullseye, that is, John. Let's go for that. And within minutes of opening this third trench, we've got features. The mighty big one. It's huge, huh? It looks like John's just come up trumps again. Seems to be too big for a drain, doesn't it? Yes. I mean, obviously Viking drains were like that, but a lot, lot smaller. But it is just like a lintel grave. Yes. Yeah. It is a grave. It is a grave. Yeah, is I it? can see. I can see um, two femurs popping up. Oh yes. No, I can see them too. You're right. <laughs> Brilliant. Wow. <laughs> and yet some people still aren't satisfied. Stuart's already got his sight set on the field next door. Clearly, we've got big earthworks in this field, this slope down yep. here. Um, but I did a quick survey of these earthworks just to try and get a handle on them. There's the road. That's yeah. where the geophysical anomalies are on the other side. And there's this pattern of earthworks on here, which may or may not have something to do yeah. with the area we're looking at. Um, and I think it's worth exploring what's going on in here. That's, that's a valid strategy. We would have to, otherwise the story's going to be incomplete. The only problem is, I don't know when we'll get the chance to investigate this field, because the archaeologists are getting very excited about Helen and Rakshar's stone-lined grave, which appears to have completely protected the body inside it. No earth, no dirt, just a fantastically preserved skeleton. I've never, ever seen a grave with no dirt in it. I know, yeah. it's really, really spooky, isn't it? It is. Nothing sweet. collapsed in it. It's exactly as it was when the lintels were put on it. I've never seen anything like that, never in all my life. Mm. Never. On top of that, Matt has now found the full extent of his kist burial. So that, at least we know where the top of it is now. Yeah. Right, we can shovel all that. As well as locating another grave at the other end of his trench. We are beginning to get what almost certainly is the northeast corner of the keel. In fact, the only place we don't seem to have a burial is in the keel trench. But Mick believes what was once Phil's potential grave has turned into something even more interesting. It looks like a little stone box yeah. with a lid on it. I'm wondering whether it isn't some bone deposit, like a, like, almost like a shrine or something like that. I'm really intrigued with that. I'd be interested to see what's inside it. What you got down your end, Bridge? <laughs> I guess I'm smack back in the middle, I think, Tony, at the moment. You know, we've got Phil's wall over that side here. 
But can you see there's the two lines of pit yeah. stones coming towards us? Yeah. We actually think this is the altar yeah. to the chapel. Yeah. yeah. And you're like this, but what we got out of Oh, we've look got at out that. Of Fantastic. Look at the quantity yeah. and the size yeah. of these quartz pebbles yeah. coming out. Yeah. Dates, dates, dates. That's oh. what they say they want yeah, to. Yeah, yeah. This, this is still the problem, isn't it? What we have to do is we have to pull this thing together very, very carefully, very, very systematically, yeah. and, and do things in terms of relative stratigraphy. In other words, one thing is earlier or later yeah. than another. Yeah. That's the way we've got yeah. to do it. And in fact, the bones are our best bet because we may get a radiocarbon date from them. That's yeah. that's going to be the the clincher. But I mean, it's absolutely fantastic what we've got. You know, I mean, it's like all the stuff you see in Ireland, Wales, Cornwall, all bundled together in one little hole. It's <laughs> wonderful, absolutely wonderful. This has been a really wild day. Not just the crazy weather, but the archaeology has been extraordinary too. This is just the first of a whole number of graves that have been popping up all afternoon. But that may just be the beginning because Stuart's been for a wander and he thinks that this keel and cemetery site extends not just to the edge of this field but way over there into the other field too. If he's right, you can't help wondering just quite how important this whole site is. It's the beginning of day two on the Isle of Man and the storms of yesterday have given way to much more agreeable weather. The seventh fairway of this golf course is now awash with archaeology. We may have come here because of the keel, a small stone chapel, but we've ended up with so much more on our plates. In one hour yesterday afternoon, we found, what was it, five graves? Yeah, I think so. Two down there, certainly two here, another one there, and we think possibly from five or six. So big deal, Mick, we found graves in a cemetery. Surprise, surprise. Yeah, but it's useful for dating and building up a chronology. Not that we can tell the date of these graves from looking at them, although they're very typical of that early Christian period, but the bones will be useful for radiocarbon dates. What I'm intrigued about, though, is these graves here appear to be within this curving yeah, arc, yeah. and that really is unusual. Whether it's an earlier feature that's been reused, yeah, yeah. Um, we don't know, but it, it's fascinating at the moment. So many of these sites start out as prehistoric cemeteries with barrows and things and the barrels get put in so it may be that this is reflecting that it may be that the mound that the keel itself is on is reflecting an early barrow cemetery um, we're not used to run the job. it looks like phil's keel will now keep him occupied for the rest of the dig he's established two wall lines as well as the altar and what mick thinks is a small stone built relics box it's measuring something like only 40 centimetres across there. Yeah. So I, I'm, I'm thinking if we can take this off and basically do a micro excavation. But we still don't have a date for the keel and we haven't worked out how it was constructed. In fact, we don't even know where the door is. And then there's the rest of the site, dominated on the geophysics by these two massive concentric ditches. All the graves we've discovered are inside this outer enclosure ditch, which is normal for early Christian burial grounds. Yeah, I got it. Yeah. yeah. Ooh. Oh, I can see a skull or part of one anyway. Right, okay. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah, look at these. That's the pelvis that we could. Do you remember we looked through the gap earlier yeah, on and we said that the pelvis was right up against I think these yeah. are fairly stable because they've got quite good. We're constantly there. searching for clues, and there's a hope among the diggers that it's not just the burials that will give us a date. Yeah. One, two, three. We've already had one carved cross, and there's a chance that in among all this stonework, there may be other more identifiable and datable examples of writing or carving. It doesn't look anything deliberate, does it? Nothing man-made, though, is there? <laughs> the Isle of Man's littered with stonework, demonstrating how different cultures came here and reinvented the island's language, religion and art. The best examples are across the island at Magold, where a collection of stones show how Christian art evolved over hundreds of years, including the turbulent 10th century when Vikings settled on the island, bringing their pagan beliefs. Scandinavians didn't have a tradition of sculpting stone, but uh, amazingly, they take it, adopt it, adapt it, and the vast majority of the examples on the island date to the period after the Scandinavian settlement. So what's this one? Well, this one's broken, 
but um, almost certainly it would have had a cross uh, at the top of the sculpture because we have a number on the island where we have uh, crosses at the top and Scandinavian imagery. So is it pagan imagery? Well, yes, there's some interesting figures here. There's a um, profile of an otter here. It's holding a fish in its mouth. And there's a little figure down here holding a stone in its hand. That represents the god Loki from Norse mythology casting a stone at an otter eating a, a salmon, which is from the Sigurd um, mythological uh, stories. So you've got a Norse myth on a cross which is Christian? That's absolutely uh, the case. And the Sigurd story is particularly um, significant because uh, one of the most famous scenes in that story is that Sigurd kills a dragon and races its heart. And to test whether it's cooked or not, he sticks his thumb into the dragon's heart. It's very hot, so he sticks it in his mouth. Now, at that moment, after he consumes the dragon's blood, he can miraculously then uh, understand the words of the birds. And it has been argued that there may be a parallel between that and the Christian Eucharist, where we, we have enlightenment through the consumption of the body and the blood of Christ. So is this a case of the, the Vikings weaving their own myths into the Bible myths? Yeah, that, that's right. I mean, you can almost regard this sculpture as a teaching aid where someone is showing that there are parallels between the two different belief systems. This fusion of Viking and Celtic culture also had an effect on the island's architecture. Ah, no issue, yes. And Andy now believes that the construction techniques used in the keel suggests it's post-Viking from the 11th century onwards. At the moment, we seem to have a very nice face on the inside, yeah. but a very raggedy face yeah. on the outside. This wall, as it stands, is simply not wide enough to stand. The more I look at it, the more I feel that maybe these long walls might have an inner leaf that's stone, and then you've got a turf bank, effectively, providing mass to make sure that the stone walls inside don't spread. Any rod, it doesn't still give me great cause for optimism that we've actually got a corner. Come on, sweetheart. It's almost halfway through day two, and we've just started to lift the first of our skeletons from Matt's trench. It's quite delicate, yeah, so I don't want that. it. It's just... dissolved, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah. So there's a little bit of new burn, a little bit of ostefites oh. on there. That's just damaged while it's been in the ground there. So is that an ageing? That, that yeah, it's probably age-related. Mix decided this is a prime candidate for carbon dating, as it lies just inside the outer ditch, suggesting it was already here when the grave was dug. But more intriguing is the second burial in the trench, containing the skull of a child or youth because this one has been cut through by the inner ditch, meaning this ditch is later than the burial, and this poses something of an archaeological conundrum. Are the ditches of two different dates, or are the burials? Oh! Oh, wow! Oh, that look. is wonderfully preserved. There's something there that looks like it could be here. On the other side of the site, the kissed burial in Helen and Rakshar's trench is causing a stir for a very different reason. It's the most incredible thing I've ever seen. That must be here. In London, you have lead coffins that keep it as airtight as possible, mm. and there's lots yeah, of preservation of you know, soft yeah. tissue and hair, but this is quite unusual, isn't it? Well, it is, but then again, if you look at it, you've got fairly similar circumstances in that you have just got air within here. It's been kept at probably a fairly constant temperature. It's not been getting hot and cold and hot and cold. There's no soil lying over the top of it. So you've almost created the similar kind of circumstances, but over a much longer period of time in a stone coffin. Hair just doesn't normally survive in burials, especially a thousand-year-old ones. And this is a first for everyone on Time Team. Have you ever seen this before? Not in anything of this date, no. This has just come from the topsoil just above this grave that we found. Can you see along there? Oh, my God. But there's no time for a congratulatory group hug because an equally jaw-dropping find has just turned up in Matt's trench. Get it there. Believe it or not, these faint marks could belong to one of the earliest forms of writing in the British Isles, Ogham. Basically, it's an Irish script which um, comes across the Irish Sea into the Isle of Man, uh, Galloway, Wales, Cornwall gets used to record 
uh, memorials or often just references to important people. Do you think it could be associated w with the grave? Could it be a memorial stone or a part of the grave slab? Well, I think so, yeah, because I mean, I, the, the straight edge along the side there is just like the grave slabs that we had on the other grave there. And this grave has, has been disturbed. It was trench we were originally looking for two ditches. I think I'm actually standing on one of them here mm. and it seems to chop through that. If it is from the grave, then that's exciting as well because the, the other stones that we have are um, pillar stones which may have been near the site of, of a burial um, but not actually in a burial like this. I think we'll know more when we, when we know what it said. We're now going to have to track down a Celtic writing specialist to see if we really have discovered some Ogham. Meanwhile, the rest of the investigation continues. Stuart's still trying to work out how the keel and its increasingly impressive cemetery fit into the landscape. He's discovered that this road beside the keel is only 200 years old and gives a false impression of our site. We actually need to be looking at a much bigger area. So Geophys, fresh from finding those fantastic graves... Keep going! and now surveying the road and the new field to see what exactly is going on. Helen, have you ever seen anything like that before? Well, I've seen them in books and I've seen the old one in a museum, but I never thought I'd see one actually newly discovered. I mean, I don't think one of these has been found for donkey's years. But somebody said, oh, we've got an Ogham stone. I thought, oh, great big boulder with cuts down the side. When I saw that, that's more like a sort of practice piece. It's more like somebody learning to do it. You know, like this morning we're going to, you're going to write your name and address in Ogham, right? And this is the, the result by slate. lunch. Yeah. Yes. It looks more like that, like a trial piece than, than a message, really. I see what you mean. Yes, I, it does. I don't it feel 100% convinced about it, to be honest. I'm not going to allow you to diminish my excitement <laughs> any longer. <laughs> no. I thought, uh, essentially, I thought this was a, a brand new, fabulous yeah. artifact that was plucked out. Yes, yes. Well, it's it's just extremely some important. Plant. Practice <laughs> scribble. But that's, it, that's down, equally it? important. If it's somebody actually learning to produce the language to, for a career in going off making gravestones, that'd be fantastic. So Teaches it's, us more about it than any actual formal finished yeah. thing ever could. You'd rather find a novice monk's scribblings than yes, thieves absolutely. writing. This is, I think this is the find of, of, yeah. of Matt's life. Hopefully, an email of Victor's transcription will land in an Ogham expert's inbox very shortly and we'll get a definitive analysis. Andy, look, this is working. we got the wall coming along here. And at last, we've had a breakthrough on the keel. Well, that's where we predicted, because yeah. if you remember, from that corner to the middle of the altar was two metres, and another two metres from the middle of the altar... Oh, you got a stick. I've got a stick. Bingo. Yeah. And that, Bingo. that is it. That is it yeah. running long. Keels tend to have a standard ratio of width to length, and this means we can now target our efforts onto the missing wall. One, two, three, four, five. We should be about here. Yeah. I tell you what, if it is about here, it will indicate that they knew exactly where the middle of the building was when they put that stone up. But he's slapped back yeah. in the middle. Good point. Very good point. Yeah. All we have to do now is prove the wall is there. Let's get yeah. on with it. Oh, and find the chapel door that so far eluded us. Over in Matt's trench, Mick's become intrigued by the ditch that's cut through one of the burials. This kist was there with a burial in it, and then it was dug into when this ditch was put through, and that's why we've only got half of it. And they mm. bung the balance back in the corner. Yeah. Which, Guys, uh, I've got some news for you. We have now got uh, an email from Dr. Ross Trench Jellicoe, oh, yes, yes, who's yes. one of the preeminent specialists Absolutely. in Ogham yeah. writing, and mm. he says that it is definitely Ogham. Right. What? It is <laughs> 11th to 12th century, or wow. in the 11th to 12th century yeah. tradition, yeah. and it's part of the Norse tradition. Wow. Wow. What does it say he doesn't know yet? Oh, right, OK. <laughs> Have you ever found any Ogham writing before? No. 
Well, you, you wouldn't. Most of us haven't, don't we? <laughs> and it's first for you too. Right. Oh, crikey, yes. I mean, that's, it's a, a sort of find of a decade yeah. at least, yeah. isn't yeah. it? Yeah. yeah. That'll be going in really? his next book. <laughs> <laughs> We're now more determined than ever to get a translation by the end of the dig. I reckon, looking at that, she looks like she might be somewhere between 25 and 35 from her tooth wear patterns. Right. As for our other outstanding find, well, it's now too late in the day to lift the body in Helen's trench, so we're preparing to cover it and protect it until tomorrow morning. It's that kind of stuff that if you breathe on it, it's going it's to go, isn't it? It's so delicate. Oh, there's another stone there. But Phil's now confirmed the size of the keel. Ooh. And with the last scrapings of an already fantastic day, he's made one final discovery. Ooh. How are you getting on then, Phil? Typical of you to come in just at the right minute, isn't it, eh? Well, you, did you, the... you, you didn't sniff it, did you? You hadn't got the door, have you? Well, I reckon we have. Really? Well, look, we've got a gap in here. Very narrow, true. But on this side, look. We've got this big stone in there, and surely that's going to be far too narrow to put a doorway in. It's always structurally not a very good idea to have a door or a window right in the corner, is it? I it's... know that, man, yeah, but I yeah. didn't build it. No, no. <laughs> Clearly not. No. <laughs> and you don't think that gap there is wide enough next to that stone to... You'd have to go in sideways. You would, wouldn't you, really? Yeah. What a day it's been. Under here, is the rarest of archaeological finds, a piece of plaited human hair that's probably at least a 1,000 years old. And also today, we've come up with another of the rarest of archaeological finds, a piece of slate with some Viking writing on it. But still at the centre of our site is this, our Kiel Chapel. And our prime job tomorrow is to lift all this stone and see if we can find a way of dating it. And we've got just one day left. Beginning of day three here in the Isle of Man, where we're trying to unpick the early history of the Mount Murray Golf Club. And look at this amazing find. It's plaited human hair, probably at least a thousand years old. So rare a find that none of our archaeologists have ever experienced it in the ground before. But that's only one element of the extraordinary archaeology we've come across over the last two days, the centrepiece of which is this keel building. Although, quite frankly, after two days, it still looks to me just like a mound of stones. Phil, do you actually know what you're doing here? Yes, Tony. <laughs> I have every reason to know exactly what I'm doing. That's then better. what are you doing? <laughs> the fact is that what we did yesterday was we've managed to define the extent of, of the keel. What we've got to do now is answer specific questions. And the specific yeah. questions we've got to address is the detail of the construction of the altar and the significance of the altar. So we'll be looking at the east end. And we also still want to resolve where the doorway is, so we will be going yeah. down at the west end as well. The other problem we've got is that we don't really still have any useful dating evidence. And around this keel, there's a little enclosure. And we think that the ditch around that is a, is a good place to look for that and the area inside it. So we're going to take a trench from the edge of the present excavation down over that ditch around it, hopefully to get some material right close to the keel and in the, in the ditch. So we're taking the ditch and the anomaly outside. And so one final trench goes in over one final feature on this already breathtaking site, where the quality and significance of the archaeology has created an incredible buzz among the archaeologists, including some who should know better. So it's almost no surprise that just under the topsoil in Rakshar's new trench, we uncover another stone-lined grave, or kist. Yep. <laughs> you do get your geophysics right sometimes, don't you? <laughs> you just dig it. We now have a series of clear targets, where we can use all the archaeological and scientific techniques at our disposal. Are you sort of feeling for the vibes or something? <laughs> and then there's the trench that seems to work on another more emotional level. Isn't it funny that we've all been so galvanised mm. by this hair? It's no older than the bones, no younger than the bones, but somehow the bones are a dead body, but hair's a person, isn't it? Well, it's something that's really recognisable to an individual. It's something you notice about people when you're looking at them. You look at their face, you look at their eyes, you look at their hair. 
And that's it's because it's plaited as well. You can still yeah. see what it would have looked like. It's not a skeleton, it's not a grave, it's a person. Mm. So I'm actually terrified here. It's all going to fall apart right in front of you all. The problem is that although it looks quite robust, mm. what happens when hair decays is it sort of gets like a, almost like a cortex, a hard outer shell around it. Mm. And it looks fine, but inside it's absolutely porous. All structure's gone, so it can easily just compress and fall apart. Just so, crumble as you lift it. Yeah. Do you think it was specifically laid out like this for the burial? Normally a plait, if it's a single plait, would lay behind your head and that really does look like it's been pulled round and laid over her right shoulder while she, when she was placed in the grave. Yeah. To hold this one bit in place. Here we go. It's wedging on. Just need to work it a little bit. Jackie, there's also something about the way it's so coiled and curled mm. that makes it so human, doesn't it? Coming up. Stick it into the post. Okay, right. Shall I take it up? You got it there. <sighs> <laughs> you breathe again there. <laughs> but it was the radiocarbon date of the skeleton that made the survival of this hair even more incredible. The body was much older than we initially thought. This young woman was buried here 1,400 years ago, making this 6th century burial the earliest Christian grave ever found on the island. Any progress on this doorway, Andy? Well, I don't know, Phil. I think, I think possibly things are starting to resolve themselves. We've got a door reveal here. And I think this big slab here is our other door reveal, but it's fallen, fallen at some in. point. The other interesting thing is that we've actually, we've actually found a little rivet. Good Lord. Now, whether that's out of the door, I'm really not sure. It's a bit on the small side, but... <laughs> this is effectively our first proper find, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Well, it is. <laughs> By establishing the position of the door, we now have the footprint of the keel, and that means Ray San can start to build his 3D reconstruction of the chapel. Yeah. I suppose if we had the buttressing of this earth on inside, mm. we'd only need it on both sides anyway. We can keep the gable ends clear. Yeah. For it relies on a mass of turf and earth on the outside to hold everything up and just provide mass and, and stability. Um, where I've seen that before has been in Viking Age farmsteads. And if that's the case, then it's a slight inkling to this being a Viking Age keel rather than, say, you know, an earlier thing that, that predates Viking invasion. We now believe this chapel was built around the early 11th century, when the Viking incomers converted to Christianity. That ties in perfectly with the date of the Ogham script we're hoping to translate. And now, thanks to Rakshar's trench, we've got an idea how the Viking keel fitted into this landscape. Mick. One ditch around this keel. Yeah. One oh, grave. Crikey, yeah, that's good. And once we got that, we extended. Oh, all right. Second one. So does that mean each of these blobs on your geophysics is likely to be a grave, then? It's looking that way. Well, that's very useful, isn't Which it? Which is absolutely fantastic. Crikey. So these are all outside? These are outside. That big ditch? Yeah. So we've almost got a zone of cemetery or something. That's brilliant, isn't it? Not bad. So the chapel stood in its own defined enclosure with burials beyond. But it turns out the archaeology on this site isn't all from a single period. All the burials we carbon dated had results centred around 590 AD, 400 years before the Viking keel was built. And as there are no burials in the centre of the cemetery, this would suggest that there'd been a sacred focus to this site long before the Vikings arrived, perhaps a wooden chapel they eventually rebuilt in stone. And now, work carried out by Stuart and Henry suggests that the site was once much bigger. 
from your earlier geophysics, John, it was clear we had a D-shaped enclosure defined by these two ditches on, on this side of the road. But from the looking at the, the land, it's quite clear there's a hill that goes like that, and we we're sort of expecting to see these go all the way around, weren't we? I've surveyed that, that area and I've created this 3D model of it, so exactly what you're saying, there's, if you follow that, the edge of that ditch down, you trace that round, down this edge of slope, all the way around here, and even joining right back up to those, those ditches, all the way around here, right around the back and following up, so you, you expect there to be a large oval enclosure. It's got there. a clear and distinct identity, that hill, hasn't mm -hmm. it? Later agriculture may have destroyed any trace of a ditch in the next field, but geophys have found enough evidence to indicate the spiritual roots of this site lie much further back in time. And then look, that ring at that point there. That's very distinctive, isn't it? Because it, it's very similar to these others on the other side of the road, as if it's part of a, a group. Yeah, but look at the position. I've actually draped this on top of the 3D as well. Just look at where that is. Uh, right. right on the top of the hill. That's a very distinct position, that. I mean, that, that's a classic place for a, a, a Bronze Age burial mound, isn't it? Yeah, well, if, 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 you're, if you're living down below, you'd see that as a lump on the horizon. Mm. It's perfect. So what we might have then is a hill with prehistoric burials on that at a later date has the church keel on the one side. Quite possible. And it's a theory that's now backed up by archaeological evidence just discovered by Matt. We've got the outer ditch going around here. Right. We found the cut for that. It misses that grave completely. So there's no relationship between the grave and the cut, but I did right. get out the top of it this huge, quite well-preserved chunk of prehistoric pottery. Oh, true. So that ditch could be, could be Bronze Age. Uh, yep, absolutely. That's a Bronze Age bit of pottery. Have you been able to show that these two parallel ditches are the same date now? Oh, no, Mick. In fact, completely the opposite. Completely the opposite? Completely the opposite. The inner ditch yeah. cuts through one of the lintel graves up there, so the inner ditch appears to be later than the, these, these graves which would put a good couple of thousand years between each ditch. The outer ditch seems to follow the boundary of the Bronze Age burial ground that was then later reused as a Christian cemetery. But we now believe this inner ditch was dug around the same time as the 18th century road to protect the remains of the keel. And yet they're parallel. Mm -hmm. Well, the only way that will work is if the people who were surveying that ditch in could either see this ditch or a bank going with it and related it to it. Yeah, that's, that's the only way they could do it, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. I've certainly got to the bottom of the side of the altar, mm. and I'm pretty much getting towards the base of the front of it. It's a surface but it's characterised by masses and masses of quartz pebbles. So do you think there are surface as opposed to offerings inside the altar or beside the altar? That might be some sort of a floor. So that's much more architectural, which is, I think, what's actually happening in here as well. They seem to be using, again, these angular bits of quartz, and they're putting them around the Let's inside of the kist, and they're formed like a little box. And inside it was a lot of, of the soil. You can see here it's charcoal flecked brown, but it comes also down onto this very yellow clay. And that's where I'm stopping. It's almost like instead of using like a wooden box and putting it in there, they've used these to construct the box to contain something like relics. Now, one thing that's been nagging me since day one is that. Do you think that that stone's got anything to do with your box? What, what I can say is that the dimensions fit. Well, it would actually it slide would in here? literally just slide right here. And if this keel became less important over time, those relics may have been taken yeah. somewhere else. That would explain why this is being disturbed and then sort of put into the wall area that we can see now in this collapse. Well, logically, I suppose if they were going to empty that out, they got to take that out first. It would be the first thing to go. Yeah. Yeah. What venerated objects were in this quartz-lined box, we can now only guess at. But they lay at the east end of a chapel where priests once worshipped on a quartz floor and prayed at a carefully constructed stone altar. And all this inside the stone and turf-walled keel the Vikings built on a 500-year-old Christian cemetery, 
which itself occupied a burial ground that had already dominated the Manx landscape for over a millennium. After three days hard work, we've now got only one mystery outstanding and it just happens to concern one of the most important discoveries we've ever made. All day the team have been on tenterhooks to see if we might get a translation of the Ogham script and uh, Helen and Dawn have been on the phone to Scotland. Yeah, Kate Forsyth at University of Glasgow, she's, uh, she's the national Ogham expert um, and she can actually read it. It's Gaelic and it dates to the 11th century and, and Gaelic is of course the language of the Scottish Isles and of Ireland and eventually of the Isle of Man. And? Well, what it seems to be is this word apparently means corner. I'll just leave you with that. Corner? And then I'll go into the more exciting mm. stuff. Yeah, this is back for corner. Now this says okoikat, which apparently means 50. And this says eal, which means apparently group, gang, throng, maybe group of warriors, something Ooh. like that. <laughs> This dates to the 11th century, which is a really interesting period in the history of the Isle of Man. And in 1079, a, a man called Godred Croven um, captured the island and established the Kingdom of Man and the Isles. Um, he had been a mercenary at the Battle of Stamford Bridge in 1066, mm. fighting for the Norwegian king. And you know, he establishes the, the, the kingdom of this island. Um, and, and the idea that this records you know, 50 warriors, potentially, that, that came here in the 11th century, mm. which was a small community, I mean, that mm. would have had a serious yeah. impact. Look at his face, he hasn't said a word. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still stunned. There's so much to take in. There's so many possibilities about what it might mean. Um, and, and there's the whole issue of who is it who's speaking this or writing it. Yeah. It's the first time that we get that language here on the Isle of Man so early, as far as I'm aware of. So this could be the first writing in Gaelic that's yeah. been found on the Isle of yeah. Man. Mm. And this is almost a casual, personal yeah. bit of, yeah. of, of stuff. And for me, that makes it that much more important that, it, yeah. it, that it's, it's, a, it's somebody speaking to us almost directly. That's, that's incredible, yeah. really. It's Who carved this message and what they truly meant by these words will keep archaeologists what? debating for years. Gang. But we've discovered so much about a site that only three short days ago was just a landmark on a golf course. It's amazing to think that in the past you might have seen early Christians here and Viking warriors and medieval priests, all of whom left rare pieces of evidence. And maybe we've shed some light on a history that began to be written in these words a thousand years ago.